live now hey awesome okay let's see how many people are there with us right now okay there are 42 people who uh, have joined us live right now okay hey everyone um, my name is rashmi just a quick check before starting this webinar can you hear me okay cool there's only one no uh, from Basak. So Basak, can you quickly check your audio setting and if you are not connected from Chrome browser, can you please try to do that? Because I see I'm audible to mostly everyone. Okay, let's get started. So first of all, a very, very happy new year to you all. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. Uh, today we have Helen with us who uh, is a designer from last 10 years and she is a founder of uh, Super Effective. So Helen, Helen uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I hope that uh, it is going to be an amazing, amazing session. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Hi, everyone, and Happy New Year to you guys. OK, so uh, I hope everyone can hear us. OK, yeah, yeah. So let's get started, guys. Uh, I'll quickly introduce uh, myself and who we are as Design Hill so that you know that who are who are we who is hosting the webinar and we are not aliens to you guys. So uh, quickly, Design Hill is a creative marketplace for graphic designers, um, uh, art, graphic designers and artists who come uh, and business owners to come together and you know. They can find different kind of services from logo designing to packaging designing to illustrator, you know. So if you are a, you know, talented designer or a creator or an artist who is not on Design Hill, you can, you know, quickly go and later on after this webinar, not right now, you can check out uh, www.designhill.com and you will see the kind of services that we provide. And uh, you know, and uh, the fun part, the fun part is that we have got around hundred thousand registered designers from all over the world, so which is huge. And I'm sure that today we have fifty people live right now, and most of us, uh, most of these people must be from Design Hill. So those who are not, you can check uh, the website out, and you will uh, get to know more about us. So that that's a bit about us. And uh, thank you once again for joining us for this webinar. Um, thank you again. Helen for taking out your time and uh, joining us live over here. So guys, today uh, we will be covering the topic on how to work with clients and choose the right design project as a freelancer. We see a lot of freelancers, you know, um, facing this challenge that they're not aware. Uh, either they are starting new into the um, into freelancing, or even if they have had, you know, uh, they it, it's been time to them, but they are not actually aware of what actually they can do to find the right client, to find the right project. So that's uh, most of the challenge, the freelancers are facing this challenge and hence we thought to, you know, um, use this topic and probably guide you through about it and we'll, we'll be covering a lot of questions uh, and uh, by the way we have had around 600 registration for this webinar and we have had around 600 plus questions so i have shortlisted most um, frequently asked questions most 15 or 15 questions which were mostly asked and which were relevant to this webinar so we'll go with that. Uh, we have a Q&A tab. As in when you have questions, please put it in the questions tab. We will be taking these questions uh, while we will be, you know, proceeding with the webinar. So we have divided this webinar into, you know, four pieces wherein we'll be covering one subtopic and after every subtopic we will have a Q&A session, okay? So uh, stay tuned, um, wait till the end. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. We have some time constraint, okay? So, but we will still try our best to answer all the questions. Uh, so put your questions in the questions tab and one last request, we will be rolling out a poll, okay? Um, so that we know whom we, uh, who we are talking to, who is the audience basically. So let me just do that and if you can answer that poll, <clears throat> Okay, have you received the poll already in the screen? Okay, I have published it again. So guys, if you can answer the poll, that would be great because it will help us understand our audience so that we can talk to you guys and we can give the suggestion to you guys accordingly, right? Okay. So seven people, okay. 
Helen, can you can you see this uh, the poll on the screen? The results of yeah. the poll. Yeah, I can see the question. Um, I don't see the results, so I'm not quite sure if I'm supposed to be clicking somewhere else. No problem. I'll let you know that. Okay. So so far, uh, forty three percent have said that they are graphic designers. Seventeen percent have said that they are logo designers. Three twelve uh, percent are artists. Twelve uh, are illustrator, and again eleven are UI UX. So the majority of audience that we have right now is of uh, graphic designers and uh, logo designers. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So, guys, let's get started. And um, Helen, you can uh, you know show the screen where uh, the presentation that you have prepared. Sounds good. Please let me know when you guys see it. I can see that. It is. It is visible. Okay, sure. Just give me one second. I think I might be reaching into technical difficulties. No problem. <laughs> All right. Do you guys see it now? Yeah, it's visible. Awesome. Okay, so thanks again, Design Hill, for reaching out to me and having me speak on this webinar. Today, we'll be covering how to talk, how to work with clients and choose the right design projects as a freelancer. And so um, I, I know that based on the poll, most of you guys are not actually UI UX designers, and this is actually targeted more towards designers, but I hope that you can find some key takeaways that you can carry on with your, your business from this webinar here. So who am I? I am Helen and I'm a self-taught designer with 10 years of experience in the field working with startups all the way to Fortune 500 companies. So at the moment, my partner and I run an agency called Super Effective where we are a full service creative studio offering design and development services. Client work is that we create digital products for designers, creatives, and developers to use in your day-to-day -day business. In my free time, I teach, um, I teach content on Instagram, teaching people the business of design, social media, and personal branding, as well as Design Bites for Design Premiers. As we go through this um, webinar, we'll be covering a couple of questions at the end of each section that pertains to the topic that I just spoke about. But if you have any general questions, please free, feel free to ask that at the end of the webinar. So let's get started. Helen, uh, just before uh, we get started, just a small uh, uh, request to you. Uh, since uh, yes. these attendees uh, who have joined us are from all over the world, I would request you to please, um, you know, speak a little uh, slow so that the speed is too fast. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. And yes, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that's okay. So that it is easy for everyone to understand. The speed is like very, very fast. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. No worries. Thank you for letting me know. So as I'm sure you are aware, being a freelancer is hard shit, but it doesn't have to be. And so we'll be covering some common challenges as well as some approaches to help you on your freelance journey today. Some of the topics that we will be covering are getting started without client work. I know this is really important to a lot of new designers as they get into the field. So hopefully the questions that may be brought up here will help you in your journey. And we'll also be talking about the types of clients and projects to avoid and what red flags to look out for. Leveraging your projects to lend future work as well as defining acceptable project rates for yourself and knowing when is a good time to transition into freelance full time. So one of the most common question I get is, how do I get started without client work under my belt? A couple of pointers I can share right off the bat is first, network. Do not underestimate the power of your immediate circle. So the immediate circle are the people around you, people like your family, your friends. Reach out to your family and friends and ask if they could pass your name on in social media um, or if it comes up in a conversation with perhaps their coworkers or your friends. If you have a friend that you know is starting a new business, reach out and ask if they need help with creating a website, creating logo, pre creating illustrations for them to use in their marketing materials. I think that this is one of the best way to get started because you're really comfortable with the people that you're talking to because they're your friends, first of all, and you really know what they are going to be looking for instead of trying to meander through the conversation of, oh, would they agree to my budget of $1,000, for example? And the next point you can check out is your local community. So why local community and what defines the local community? 
people are more likely to want to work with the local community talents because they feel like, first of all, you're accessible. You're in the, the city, so they can call you up and they ask you, if, hey, let's, let's grab a coffee. So instead of strictly competing on an international level online, you want to compete in a smaller pond, I say, somewhere that you know the people. So think about the people, um, the community, and think about where you usually go to for a coffee or a bookstore that you enjoy going to. So reach out to the owners and get to know them. Ask them if they have any challenges in their business. How are they trying to market themselves? Do they need help growing their social media um, content? Do they need to create a new website? And something I really want to drive home is to make sure that this is a natural experience. So what do I mean by natural experience? So instead of going into a conversation of selling, 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 uh, connect with people on a personal level. Listen to them genuinely, listen to their questions that they might have, answer them to the best of your knowledge. And even if you don't end up working with them, which tends to happen, it is great to make connections and practice the art of communicating. Which travels really, really fast in this industry. And most of our work for our agency is actually true referral. So make a good impression and don't have expectations of closing sales because at the end of the day, the most that you can walk away from is getting to know people. And if they have a positive experience for talking to you, they're going to remember you the next time they actually need work. And they're going to be like, oh, yeah, I remember talking to Helen, for example. She mentioned that she could help me with my business and I'm now ready to work on my business. So I can just give her a call. And there was the next point, which is the local chamber of commerce. This is something that a lot of people don't know about, but if you haven't heard of the chamber of commerce, it is essentially an organization whose goals are to promote local businesses. And if you are part of the local uh, chamber of commerce, you're able to connect with the new business owners in the network and the local community because they connect you with networking, true networking events, as well as they, they start, start you off with benefits and services. So if you're a part of this local networking event, you can get to know the new business owners and pitch your services to them. Because most of the time, as a new business owner, they probably haven't thought too far into creating a website or creating a branding strategy or logos from themselves yet. You can also volunteer yourself for charity work. So charities are always in need of help. Some of them may not be able to pay you. and some of them, you might be able to get something out of it, but not much. But don't go in with the intention of trying to make money out of it. Because do it because you believe in your mission. Do it because you generally think that you want to help save animals, for example. So as you first start out, the first, the main thing you should be focusing on is building experiences and connecting people, not making money. The next thing we can consider are design contests. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of design contests. Design Hill also offer design contests. So if you are just starting out, and you don't have much ex much experience, you can't expect to be paid for doing something that you don't have experience in, and it wouldn't be fair to the client. So design contest might be a good stepping stone for you if you are a student or if you are new to design in general. This wouldn't be good for seasoned designers or professionals. As a professional designer, you want to be focused around, um, you want to be focused on building your brand and your business. You do not want to be spending your time trying to compete with other designers on a design platform. As I mentioned before, I'm a self-taught designer. When I first started my design journey 10 years ago, this was actually how I started. I participated in design contests and I, I lost many of them, but over a period of time, I started to get better because every time I lost, I compared my losing design to the winning ones and I started to see where I was falling short on. I picked out on things I otherwise wouldn't have known. And the more I lost, the better I got at understanding how to improve my designers and communicating with the clients. So definitely take a look at that consider that and see whether it's a good fit for you. The next thing that you can work on is something that I'm really, really passionate about, and that is side projects. So I strongly believe that the reason why I was able to level up my skills as a designer was because of my side projects. And I think that if you work on something you're really passionate about, it really comes true in showing how, how dedicated you are to it. And you can shine so many different angles on a project. So something that I can give, for example, is um, an app that I worked on for food waste. So throughout a period of my time, I found that I was throwing a lot of food away and I felt really, really bad about it. I started to do research on my end to see if there are apps out there for me that I could participate in like using to just try to give food away if I was not using it as much as I thought I would be. And so this is one example of something that you could be, you could look into if there is something you're passionate about. And if you feel like you can design something better, like honestly guys, go for it because there is always the fear of thinking, oh, there is already 10, like 1,000 other apps out there that do it. But 
I think if you if you take a look at the ecosystem of all the apps and websites, there are so many similar similar products out there, but everyone does something a little different and bringing in your own little special something makes it different. So the only thing I would say is stay away from doing projects that are overdone. And what I mean is projects like Facebook or Spotify, stay away from redesigning Facebook and Spotify, essentially. The reason why I say this is because you do not have access to the insights that the designers on the team actually do. And instead, you should be focusing on products, solving products that you are actually passionate about and be your own client. So Helen, now that we are talking about how can you, you know, start your own project without as a freelancer without having a client project, uh, I had a similar question, and I would, I would, and a lot of people wanted to wanted the answer of that question, which is how to decide whether it is the right time, you know, to get into freelancing. How do one get to know about that? If you can throw some light on it. Yeah, I actually have that at the end of my slide, um, like the presentation. So we're going to get to that if you don't mind. Like we can wait until there. Yeah, yeah sure. Awesome. And so and the, the last thing is to actually um, look up design briefs and fake projects. I'm not sure if if um, this is something common to everybody, but there are things like brief box and group brief that allows you to challenge yourself using fake briefs that the founders of the sites created. And so this is a really, really good option for people if they do not have an idea that they want to work on and or they feel like they don't really want to participate in design contests because design briefs allow you to work on it in your own time. And you do not have the stress as compared to participating in a design contest. Red flags. <laughs> we all have our fair share of difficult clients and navigating while through working with them can be really tough. So. Here are some red flags to look out for it so you don't to ensure that you don't end up working with clients from hell. You will get clients that promise you that their product is the next Facebook or Instagram and that they are doing you a favor by letting you do the work for them for free or for exposure. Keep in mind that you can pay your rent or feed yourself on exposure. There are clients that don't value your time. And so clients that don't value your time or downplay your expertise will make your life so difficult. And an example of this is if they use oversimplification of things or use phrases like, oh, this is just going to take one hour or this, this seems easy, so it shouldn't take you too long. Why is this bad? It is bad because they are not the expert you are. They are placing the emphasis on how little time they think it will take because they think it will be cheaper for them. And really, they don't see the value in what you can do and what the outcome of the product you're going to be working on for them is. If you have clients saying things like, oh, I spoke to this other designer and he quoted me $500 for this, or something along the lines of, oh, I went on Upwork and I saw that I could get this done for like half the price he quoted me. Are you ripping me off? Honestly, let them go. Tell them to go with the cheaper options because they clearly are just shopping around for the cheapest alternatives at this point and they don't value your expertise or your working style. In the long run, having cheap and difficult clients will not do you or your business any good. So this is sort of like uh, what we have. We, I'm totally open to answering any questions if anybody has questions regarding what I just talked about for red flags to look at. Her. Yes, I do have one. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, yeah. So one question which was asked by the registrants was how to say no to a client, which is which can be very much important at times. But then, uh, you know, one has to figure out a way to be polite enough to say no to a client. So what are, what are your suggestions on that? That how can you say no to a client? So I think it really depends on why the reason for why you're saying no to a client. Is it because you feel like you're not able to take on the project at that moment because they're not paying you well enough? They're not paying you, um, they're not, you're, you do not have the time for it, or you just don't feel like it is a good fit. So it depends on what kind of tone of um, voice you want to take with this conversation. If you want, as a, as a designer, if I have a client come to me and I don't feel like it's a good fit, first of all, I would think about the reason why it's not a good fit. And I would look into my network to see if there's anybody that I could refer the client to, granted that the client is a good client. And what I mean is, if I know the client is trying to rip me off by asking me to do something for them for like, for example, $500, and I feel like that is way below market rate, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pass this on to my network because it wouldn't be fair to them. So if the client is not somebody I will share, I wouldn't share. So I would just say that to, to be as diplomatic as possible, I would say that I am not available to take on the project at this moment, but I hope that you're able to find somebody to work on this and best of luck. So that is the easiest way to politely decline a client. 
if you're busy right now, um, you can tell them, hey, I'm really sorry, I cannot take on the project right now. But if you are willing to wait for a, a month or so, depending on your, your schedule, of course, tell them that you are you will be happy to connect with them again if they haven't found a designer they want to work with. So by being polite and setting expectations for when a client can hear back from you, you're not keeping them in limbo, trying to figure out whether or not you want to work with them. So again, the reason for why you're saying no is really important. I hope that answers the question. Please let me know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, yeah, that's the best way to be polite at the same time and to say no because of, you know, depending on the kind of reasons that you have had. Okay. Uh, one uh, one last question from me and then we'll jump to the uh, the questions tab. Uh, so it is, sure. um, as, as we say, that first impression is the last impression and it is very much important when you are, you know, dealing with clients, you have to make sure that you are creating that first impression so that you, can, you guys can, you know, work together. But... Um, and one of the questions that I have with me is that how to start um, how to start a conversation with client and what question should one be asking to probably uh, um, you know to probably do the right project or regarding the project. So how to start a conversation with client and how to uh, you know uh, what are the important things that we need to ask for projects. Okay, great. So it really depends on whether you're first approaching a client for the first time or if they're, um, they reach out to you and you're trying to get the conversation and the ball rolling. So if you're trying to define whether this is a good fit for the both of you, you want to understand what exactly the client is looking for out of the relation, the working relationship. So you want to know whether or not you're able to, first of all, deliver what, on whatever timeline they're looking at and understand what kind of expertise and skill set they're expecting from you. If they are trying to release really something that is not going to work within a certain time frame obviously this is something that you should keep in mind and not accept the project just because you want the money because it wouldn't be fair to the client if you're doing it in a un, in a rush manner so you want to talk to them and make sure that they they understand uh, you you both understand where you're coming from and um sorry what's the question again can you repeat yourself and i just missed on it I'm oh, sorry, can you please repeat the question? I, I want to make sure that I got it right. So the question was, how do you start a conversation with a client and what are the important things that we need to ask before taking up a project? Got you. Thank you very much. So you want to ask them about the scope of the project, understanding the deliverables and the timeline, understand what kind of help do you need from you. So this is exceptionally important because sometimes clients think that they need a website in order to help their business to grow. But really what they need is brand strategy where you dive in and understand where they're falling, falling short in their business. Sometimes the clients think they have to self-diagnose everything, but really when they reach out to you, you should take on more of the leadership and the, expertise, uh, the expert role where you help them to understand where their problems are because it's not as easy and it's not as black and white as they seem to think. So understand the scope of the project, understand the timelines, understand the milestones that, and the deliverables that you're supposed to do, and understand really how you're able to help them more than what they think they're coming to you for. Awesome. Thanks for these tips. Yeah, let's move ahead to uh, the questions that people are asking in the question section. So guys, one more thing that I would, uh, I would want to highlight over here is that if you guys are uh, if you guys have the same question and if you guys feel that you know i even uh, you want the answer of the same question which is already there in the question tab please upvote the same and we will be taking up that first considering you know that's something that most of you guys want to know okay good so helen can you move to the question tab please oh yeah sure sorry if you see me if you guys see me looking down it's because i have my ipad here so i can look at the questions <laughs> Okay, yeah. great. So, so, um, so, Shoga, I, I am sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong, uh, is asking how to determine pricing of projects, oblique commissions. So, basically, how to decide the right project, right price for a project. Thanks for asking this. I'm actually going to be covering this in uh, one part of my my present uh, presentation. So, if you don't mind waiting until I get there, I think. I think that it should help to answer the question actually. Okay, so let's move forward to the next questions then. Um, sure. Uh, how to give an awesome pitch to clients regarding a project? So basically how to pitch a project right? That's uh, what he meant. 
Okay, great. So this is actually a really fun question. So if I give a scenario right now and paint a picture of it, if you come into a, for example, a coffee shop that you, you really enjoy because you go to the coffee shop maybe three to five times a week, you go there for your morning coffee and you really like the vibe, you like the people that you interact with because the staff are so friendly, the, the owners are always so nice. I think that it really comes down to First of all, you want to try and relate to them on a personal level. So you're showing your face. First of all, you're showing your face quite often. They're going to get to know you. Get to know them by a first name basis and connect to them. Just like I mentioned before, connect with them on a personal level. And so when you get into getting to know them personally, sometimes people are more likely to open up and talk about the things that they're doing day to day. And then you can start to ask questions that relate more into what you're trying to get out of it. If you think that the coffee shop is awesome, but people don't seem to be coming there at peak hours because maybe it's a little bit f further hidden away. You can approach the owners or the staff working there and ask them if there's anything you can do to help. You can tell them that, hey, I'm a designer or I'm a brand strategist. I would like to take on uh, helping you to grow your, your business because I really love the coffee here. You guys are always so nice. So I took a look at your social media profile and I feel like if you actually share more post, uh, pictures of your, your coffee or if you redesign your website, you can bring in more people. So without trying to make it sound like, um, like a slimy uh, car salesman, come in as more of a personal, like a relatable person. Come in talking more on a level that they understand because they can relate to you. You actually are talking about their products. You're talking about their services. You're talking about the vibe of, and how it makes you feel. And when people see this coming from you they feel like they're you're more relatable they feel like you're more genuine and i think that is really important for when you're pitching something to people great i hope you have got the answer of your question okay so i think we should move forward with the presentation and then we can jump back to the questions again great yeah case studies are the money makers of any creative's portfolios so People, potential clients don't go to your website to learn more about you really. And I hate to be that person that says that, but the reality is they want to learn more about what you can do for them. We talk about what type of clients to avoid and the red flags that you should look out for. And now we're gonna be talking about how to leverage your projects to get the work you will enjoy. Display the type of work that you want to get hired for. So if you are looking to do um, if you are looking to get UI UX design um, work, and even if you do illustrations and animations for fun, if you want to be hired as a professional UI UX designer, display the type of work that relates to it. Don't confuse your potential clients with other types of work that they are not sure whether you do this for fun or if you do this seriously. If you, if you put too much of a variety on your portfolio, it's going to dilute your brand and your perceived professionalism. You should be focusing on displaying the recent work as well. So pick Pick from your whole portfolio and choose three to six, six being the max, by the way, three to six of your strongest projects. And what I mean by recent projects is that anything older than four years is a big no-no. Go for the most recent projects, choose three to six and stick to it. One of the most common questions I get is, is it okay to display site projects even if they were not paid work? And absolutely guys, like this is really important. There's nothing wrong with doing so. In fact, I actually think it's a great idea especially if you're a new designer and you haven't had the chance to work with other clients yet. So again, if you're going to be displaying side projects or passion projects, the, the thing you want to focus on is to make sure that it relates to the type of work you want to get hired for. So if you do not want to be working for a client that is a bank, do not display financial um, projects. If you want to be working more with coffee shops, if you want to be working with fashion brands, do and showcase the type of work that you want to be hired for. Don't if you're going to be showing your side projects, please do not display it at the very top of the, pro the portfolio piece that it is the concept piece. You do not need to mention it. You can find a way to fit it somewhere in the portfolio um, pro page, but just don't pretend that it is for a real, pro um, a real company or a real client because it isn't, so just don't do that. But again, make sure that you present it in the same way you would with pay if you have paid work. So you want to talk about the challenges and the problems that you are trying to solve and your proposed solutions and why it is better or how you're making it better. Something important to note is when you are done with client projects, you can ask them for referrals and recommendations. If you ask them to provide you with a recommendation on LinkedIn, it's exceptionally helpful because 
on LinkedIn, you are going to have um, related connections that will see your recommendations from other clients you work with. And you can also use the recommendations that you get and put it into your website and your resume. Don't forget to thank your client when they do that. And you can also ask them for future referrals as well. So something that I really like to do is when a project has just finished or, or wrapped up, um, within the, the next few days or a week, I would send a follow-up email to thank my client for their time and the, the relationship, the working relationship. And it will say, I would say something along the lines of like, hey, client A, I really enjoyed working with you on this project and I hope you did too. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you need any more work done in the future or if you know anyone who's looking. I would really appreciate the referral. Thanks. And so it's short and sweet. It is friendly and fun. And I think this is just a good way to keep the, um, the relationship going without becoming too, too professional, too cold. And people are, after all, everyone, even though their clients are still people and they like to relate to friendly people, you can still be professional and good at your job and be fun and friendly at the same time. So with everything I just mentioned about an example of how to uh, write the follow-up email, the reason why this is so important and what it shows is that A, you are open to working with them in the future. B, you're open to opportunities from people they may know who are looking in the future. You can also touch base with them in a couple of months time. You do not have to do this um, one email and then just never hear from them again or never connect with them again. Just touch base with them in a couple of months to see how the project is going and see how they're doing and if they need anything at that time. You can, again, politely ask if they know if anybody else who's looking. Just keep in mind that you do not want to come across as too needy or, or annoying. Um, so use this sparingly. Don't, don't use this too much. Last but not least, you can get a design deck in place. So design deck versus website portfolio. While a website portfolio is great for showing your work to anyone at any time, design decks are great for a tailored experience for client presentations. And this is great because design decks is made and formatted in a storytelling format where you can walk through the potential client through the intended work that you're trying to showcase to them. And it actually helps them to envision how you are able to bring their project that they're coming to you with to life. You are also putting something together that interests them more because again, this is a tailored experience to them. And it shows the relevant skills that you are trying to, you're trying to put forward to what they are seeking. The client will also think that you're that you care a lot and you're putting in the effort to go the extra mile to put together a design deck that is tailored to them. And those are really good traits that when they think that you care and you and you put in the effort. Because if you want to be successful as a freelancer, you have to show that you care and you're putting in the extra effort to to bend over backwards and do the best that you can for them. So I'm not sure if there's any questions so far, but happy to answer any regarding design decks and portfolio. Yeah, I love I uh, specifically loved two of your points that you mentioned, which was about how to ask for reference, which is very, very important to get the uh, to find new clients and about, uh, you know, so on that lines, I think you have already answered the question on how to ask for referrals. So we I yes. had that. I had that one of the question in my mind. Uh, so since you have already asked that, second point that you covered was on portfolio. So Helen, what are your suggestions on how one can create an attractive portfolio which can, you know, probably represent the best quality of the work? So uh, do you have any tips on, you know, creating a best profile or a portfolio? Yeah, for sure. So I think the most important thing for creating the, uh, a really good portfolio that sells your business and sells yourself is to make sure that it is clean. You do not need all the clutter and the mess that comes along with creating a portfolio in order to feel like you're hooking the client. So if you, are, if you create a portfolio that is also responsive, you're going to have clients that are going to love you for that because not everyone is going to be looking at your portfolio on the desktop at all the time uh, at all times they might be out on the go and then they just heard your name in passing and they pull out your your mo the mobile version of your website seeing that their website is responsive is going to be very helpful because they can understand that you are a good designer you care about the different responsive um sizes across the board as well so focus on having a clean portfolio Display three to six of your best work. Do not put too many because the more options you put out there, the more confused a client would be and they might click on a, they might go into a portfolio that isn't your strongest suit. So focus on the three, uh, three to six best and most recent work and also have, you can put in a little bit of your personality into it, but something that I want to advise people on is to not use the most generic opening headers when you come to your website because there are so many people out there with the most cookie cutter, um, 
copy at the top. And I think that once everyone sort of do that, it, you start to blend and become a, one one blob that everyone just looks the same. So show, showcase your personality, but also talk about what you do. So if a, a client were to go to your website for the first time, as soon as they load up the page, which by the way should be fast, um, they should be able to understand what it is that you're able to offer them. And you can put a picture of yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. You can also put an illustration of yourself that's fun too, but you want to make sure that you're talking to the client that you want to sell your services to. You do not want to be putting in uh, resources for designers if your website is not meant for targeting designers. If, you're, if your website is targeting clients, make sure that it speaks to clients, not other designers, not other copywriters, whatever, um, whatever design field you're in. Awesome. That's a that's a really really great suggestions. So I see a lot of other questions as well in the question section. And uh, okay, the first one on the top is how to ask client for payment for work done. Okay, this is uh, this is interesting, and I'm sure a lot of people must be thinking, okay, now the work is done. Now how should I ask for the payment? And uh, this is a genuine question, I believe. So would you like to answer that? Yeah, for sure. So first of all, um, I want to make sure that you guys are charging a deposit before you begin work. And so we, do, we I didn't really cover this in my in this webinar, but I think this is important for freelancers, so I'm going to mention it. Before you start on any work, you want to make sure that you have a contract in place because that will cover your ass in case something just goes like his event. Anyway, so get a contract in place that details the scope of the type of work that you're doing for the client and talk about the deposit that you're, look, you're looking to get in order for you to start work. So something that is really common for designers is to do a 50% deposit upon agreement of the, the contract before you begin on any work. Before, guys, remember, before you do any work. Don't do anything halfway through and get a deposit. So 50% before you begin the work. And when the project is done, make sure that your client is actually happy and has given you the green light. So you can be having a conversation with uh, your client face to face, or you could be talking to them on the phone call. But something that I, I like to do personally is to have it in black and white. So I will draft an email that's asked them whether everything looks good to them, that, and that I will cover any points that they should have known from the, the, um, the project to date. So if everything is finished, I will say, hey, hey, client A, uh, the project um, is finished now. Please let me know if there's any further re revisions. If not, I can, I can definitely send you my invoice through um whatever payment terms uh sorry whatever payment software you guys use or, or however you get payment whether it's paypal or wave or bonsai accounting so you want to make sure that they have the chance to say no no no, i'm not done yet i want more work and this is when you can also mention that any revisions will be additional cost so this is a good way for you to make sure the client is okay with you before you send the payment over i uh, sorry before you ask for the payment wow that's great suggestion so i hope uh, you guys you have answered uh, you have got the answer of your question okay so moving forward i see uh, three upvotes in a question which is asked by paul and his question is i'll just read uh, out that question is it bad to accept a project that is a bit above your skill set in hope you will be able to do uh, to do it and progress along the way with the project that's a really good question is it bad? Yes or no? It really depends on how bad of an imposter syndrome you think you have. So everyone, everyone, even the best of us uh, have imposter syndrome. So there is nothing wrong with taking on a project that you feel may be slightly above your skill set in hopes that you can do it well. That is granted that you know yourself really well, even if you feel like it's not something that you could do really well. If you, if you believe in your abilities to learn on the job and you believe in your abilities to be hardworking and research and do the stuff that you need before while, while working on the job, by the way, um, then go for it. Don't, don't let your imposter syndrome put you down or feel like you cannot say yes to a project that you feel is out above your, your realm. But again, be conscious about what the project entails because it's not fair and it's not professional to take on a project that you think you can do but end up missing the mark on. So it, it comes down to you trying to understand yourself better as a designer or whatever background you are. I'm, I'm going to use designer in this case just because I'm a designer and I think most of you guys are as well. If as a designer, I feel like I'm not able to perform, I wouldn't accept the job. But if I feel like this is something that there's a part of me that knows I can do it and there's a part of me that is fighting with my imposter syndrome and it's just like clashing, I 
most of the time, I actually let the imposter syndrome side die down. I've taken on projects in the past where I feel like it's a little bit outside of my comfort zone because I haven't done it before. But when I relate back to all the previous projects I've worked on, I realized there was a parallel in terms of understanding how to do certain tasks. So if I was able to bring in my past experiences and use that to fit the, the, the puzzle pieces together and believe that I could do the job, I think this is the same way for you. So if you're thinking about taking on a project that is perhaps in a different field that you've never worked on, but it is a website project that you've done many of, then you can do the research to learn a new field, but it's not as if you're learning website from the ground up. So I hope this answers your question. Yeah, thanks for answering that. Okay, so we'll take one last question for now and then we'll move to the presentation. And this question is pretty interesting, I feel, which is uh, Jessica is asking, I'm not familiar with the term design deck. Could you explain that a little more? So what actually design deck is? Yeah, for sure. This is actually a great question. This is something that I have a lot of people asking me about. So a design deck is basically um, a PDF or a presentation form of your work in a PDF form that you take with you on the um, in your iPad or on your laptop that you bring to your clients. So this is also really good for you to send to clients that um, are trying to get to know what your skill set is like or like what kind of work you have worked on that is not presently shown on your website. So a design deck could be done in a presentation form. It could be whatever you want it to be, but you're telling more of a story through it. You're guiding them through an experience of a storytelling format, uh, as I mentioned before. So instead of just asking them to scroll through your long website, you're actually showing them different pieces that they can scroll through on a presentation. So this is good because if you go to, um, let's say you go to on site for a client meeting for the first time and they, they've seen your portfolio, they, they kind of like scroll through like your about page and they've seen a couple of your, your pieces there. But if you're talking to them face to face, you want to be able to go through your iPad and show them, hey, this is like on the next screen, this is what we're talking about. You're essentially guiding them through the focus on the screen itself versus trying to define reading through blocks of text and seeing images. So yeah, if you um, design deck, as if you will, is basically a presentation format of your, your best pieces of work. Great, thanks for answering that. I hope Jessica, you have got the answer of your question. So uh, shall we move forward with the presentation, Helen? Yeah, for sure. Great. So, so now we've covered how you're finding your clients and you're getting clients. The next big question is, how do you determine your rates? Pay yourself a salary as if you're hired by a company, guys. This is really important because the things that you would get if you were an employee of a company are things like insurance and health benefits, as well as having your tools and programs paid for by the company. If you dive into this, you want to calculate your rates based on how much you would like to earn in a year. The cash flow that you're making should account for fees and famine. So if you're not familiar with the concept of fees and famine, um, fees essentially refers to the times that you're making so much money because you have so much projects. Your clients are beating down your doors. They're begging you to take on your projects. Whereas famine is the total opposite. Um, famine is very real in the, term of, uh, in the world of freelancers and business and famine basically refers to the times that you're trying your hardest to find work, but work just isn't coming. So if you account for fees and famine, even if you're not getting work for slower weeks, you should have enough money to tie you over until the next project comes through the door. You also want to make sure you're not just scraping by and leaving, living on peanuts, guys, um, but you're actually making a profit. So to do so, you want to think about these factors, your experiences and skill set. Everyone's experience and skill sets are very different. And so there are a couple of questions that you can ask yourself to know where you stand in, in terms of this. So the questions you can ask are things like, how much working experience do I have? How much have I done in my career to date and how challenging were the projects? What am I bringing to the table and how will my skills benefit the project? So these are really important questions that you have to ask yourself honestly. And you don't have to answer it right on the spot right now, but think about it over the next couple of days. And so once you answer those questions, you can go online and see what designers with similar skill sets and experiences, uh, experience levels are charging. There are sites like Glassdoor, AIGA, um, Dribbble, where they release annual salary reports that you can download. And they're really helpful for you to understand what people are charging for similar levels. So check them out. And so the next is, um, in order to work, you also need to eat and pay for expenses. So what do we mean by expenses? As I mentioned before, tools and things you need in order to do your job need to be accounted for. But make sure that you also account for things like your rent, 
um, food because you need to eat, and bills. These can all vary based on your location. I personally like to keep a Google spreadsheet that, I know this is kind of like nerdy, but I like to keep a Google spreadsheet of all our expenses, whether it is the subscriptions for the tools that I use, groceries, eating out, or taking clients out for a meal, because this is really good to give us a baseline for how much we spend on average. And it is also exceptionally helpful when come tax season, my accountant is asking me for how much money I spend month to month. I can send the spreadsheet over because I've been collecting it as time went on instead of scrambling last minute and putting everything together. So depending on how busy and in demand you are, you can increase or decrease your rates momentarily. So if you are in need of more work because peace and famine, you can lower your rates to be more competitive to, to win more bids. Whereas if you're really busy, you're probably going to want to increase your rates if you have potential work coming true, because you're not 100% reliant on getting that particular project in order to pay the bills. So if you're looking to do that, you probably will want to charge maybe 20 to 50, however many percent more, because you're okay for trading your sleep and sanity in order to get more money. So the better you are and your reputation, the more in demand you will be. This is essentially where you want to get to as a freelancer, no matter what you do, whether you're a copywriter, illustrator, brand strategist, designer, you want to build your brand up to the point that your clients are beating down your door and again, begging you to take on the projects. So instead of having to constantly work, uh, hunt to get work, you want clients to be finding you instead. As for the projects themselves, there are, the scope will kind of influence the estimated cost of the project. There are things that you can consider when you think about the scope. There are things like what deliverables to, to do, like what are the clients expecting from you? If you're doing, uh, for example, you're creating a logo, do they expect you to provide the vector, ver well, vector version, obviously, but do they, prov uh, do they need mockups as well? Or do they need their logo in black and white as well? So think about things like this. And you also want to be thinking about the timeline. How, how busy, what kind of timeline are the clients looking at? Is this something that is really rushed? Or is this something that you have three to six months to work on? Uh, you also want to be working, you also want to be thinking, sorry, you want to be thinking about how much hand holding is expected for a design handoff. So if I pull in the type of work that I do as a like a product designer, there are things that I create for clients where it, there are apps. And so when I hand off my designs to the developers on their team, they will want to know whether they can get assets such as icons or if they need red lines. So knowing what kind of hand holding I need to do through this process is really, really important. And you also want to be accounting for revisions. So most of the people that I've worked with, I've provided two rounds of revisions, but of course it really depends on your on what you do. So if you plan to give them five rounds of revisions, make sure it, your your quote or your hourly rate, whatever, however you charge accounts for that. All these things that I just mentioned come into play and they will affect your rates. So if the project is really, really complicated or they have really tight deadlines, like the client needed the project done yesterday and they just reached out to you today, you want to be sure that you incorporate a rush fee on top of that in order to make more money in exchange for your sanity and sleep. And lastly, the type of client. So the type of client that you would get, you want to charge a small corner shop or a mom and pop shop around the corner or like a startup the same way you would charge a corporation. So think about who your clients are. Think about what you are doing for them, um, how, they would, how this would benefit them and what they are, import, like they are able to afford. Remember guys, this is really important because you can try to charge them 10 times the amount that they were looking to, looking to spend, but they are not, if they are not able to afford it, they cannot really pay for it, even if they believe in you or they really love your work. So most importantly though, you want to make a profit. And what is profit? So profit is basically the additional amount of money that you're making on top of the bare minimum that you're charging in order to run your business. You don't want to be just making enough to keep your business afloat, but you want to be making a profit on top of the, the amount that you're spending in order to keep your business going. So you can invest in yourself, you can invest in your business, you can have savings sets, you have savings set aside for the rainy days for famine periods where you don't have work and you can also grow your business. Um, I'm not sure if there's any questions regarding this, but this is basically the type of questions, um, the type of points that I wanted to cover in terms of um, your skill set and how to define your rates.
Yeah, Helen, and you have also highlighted few uh, very important points, which was you know. Uh, so Ayuk Mini uh, had this question on how to determine pricing of project, and you have already answered that right through the presentation. That you know, it depends upon the scope of the project, the type of client uh, you have with you, and uh, depends upon the kind of skill set and experience you have. Um, one add-on question I would like to ask from you over here is that uh, now that let's say one has decided. Decided the price of its his design, and uh, you know, and, and I have been probably do, as a designer, I have been doing, I have been you know, pricing the same uh, similar uh, price. I have been giving the similar price to my work over over these years. But how do I decide when to increase my price and how to go about it? How to start charging high as a designer? That's what most of these designers would want to know over here. Amazing! Thanks for asking that. That is actually the next slide that I'm gonna jump right in right into right now. Okay. <laughs> so when do you increase your rates, guys? I really recommend tracking your progress over a period of time and reviewing every six months to a year. So what you can do now or moving forward is review all your past projects that you've worked on and take a look at how long they they took you. You can refer to how much you were charging for all these projects and find and compare it against each other to find parallels to see if there is a common a common price that you're charging for them and you can also review the market rates so make sure you re make sure you review the market rates your past spendings your cost of living etc everything that relates to you being able to run your business and to live and define if it's time to raise your rates so throughout the years i actually track every single project that came my way so i have a rough idea of how much to charge for similar projects when they come in there are free tools that you can use for time tracking. You can download an app for it, or you can just go on the app store and find something for your desktop. So download them, try try them out and try a few because you might not find something that you like immediately. But the thing is, um, the, the most important thing is, as you get better at what you do, it will take you less time to complete the task. And this is this is really important, guys, because think about it, The when you are making, Sorry, let me re let me rephrase that. As you get better at what you do, it takes you less time. This is when you want to ensure that you're making more money than when you first started. So even if you're not working as many hours, you want to be making more. So for example, projects that used to take me 60 hours to complete, I can get it done in half the time now just because I've been doing this for so long. And with every project that I learned uh, or I took on, I learned something from it. So I am able to bring in my past experience into the next project that I take on. If I didn't increase my rates when I first started and I'm still using the same rates that I did 10 years ago, I'll be making peanuts because I'm not I'm not doing things for 60 hours anymore. I'm now doing it in 20 hours. So really the most important thing I want to I want to drive home is increase your rates as you level up. Do not stick to the same rates. I cannot stress this enough because if you're working hourly and you're not increasing your rates, as you get better, you're gonna be making less. So increase your rates. I hope this answers the question. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And we had a lot of questions on these lines, you know, on how to price your work, how to start charging high. And I just see one more question, which was, um, what if the client tells to decrease the price, but you don't want to? So guys, um, uh, Helen has already answered that question, wherein we covered a topic of how to say no to a client, right? So if you think that, you know, the, that particular client is not a right fit for you, just say no to him politely, you know. Um, so, uh, let's jump to the questions tab, Helen, and let's see if we have more questions on those lines. Sure, yeah. Okay, let me check that. Also, just one thing that I want to uh, mention here to everyone. Uh, so, guys, we keep on doing uh, these webinars uh, for the community. So, if you have more suggestions on what other topics you are interested in just drop a line in the chat section and we'll uh, find amazing speakers like helen uh, to have you. you know to have a webinar on that on those topics so just uh, drop the the topics on chat section and uh, we'll look into it okay going back to the questions okay we have answered that Okay, so we uh, David uh, is asking, how, okay, uh, how would you explain brand strategy to a client who only wants to hire you for design? I didn't. That's a great. That. That, I'm sorry. I don't. I didn't really get that question, but uh, like I don't know if you have understood that well. How would you yeah, explain I did, I did, I did. to a client who only you for design? This is a really. Good, this is a really fun question. I really think that. A brand strategist is sort of like 
a doctor who kind of diagnosed the problems that you may have, but before you even know it. So they go in and so a brand strategist basically goes in and understand the business fully. You got understanding a different faucet and different type of um different different veins or different veins of the business, if you will. So if a client comes to you and say, I want to have a website, but I do not have money for a brand strategy. So can you just do create a website for me? I think this is like this is a pain this is a pain because the client doesn't understand the importance of understanding who they are trying to market themselves to you can create a website but if your target audience is not who you think it is or who they believe it is and it ends up hit, uh, missing the mark you're wasting time and effort as well as money in order to create something that does not benefit your brand in any way at all so when you when you have brand strategy you're diving in and you're going in deep because you're fully understanding the client's business you're understanding who are the people they're trying to reach where these people are living how these people are going about on their days what affects them and what what impresses them because when you're trying to create a company you want to relate to the people that you're trying to market yourself to so if a client comes to you and say i just want a simple website but i do not want brand strategy then honestly this is when this is when you're telling the client that hey maybe this is not the best fit because in order for me to do my job the best to the best of my abilities i want to be able to provide the brand strategy so that we can do we can do this project really well i can fully understand your clients i can fully understand you and i can just do the best of my my to my abilities awesome awesome okay so next question um which is asked by Valentin, and he is asking how do you get the first client which is on the similar lines uh the uh, you know uh on my question which says which platform do you need to leverage in order to market yourself so basically yeah once you market yourself once you put yourself out there you know once you show your um, portfolio then you will be able to probably find the find your first client so would you like to answer that and i'm just clubbing these question together how do you get the first client and which platform should you use to market yourself Okay, thanks for asking. So in terms of the which platform to market yourself to, it really comes down to what kind of clients you're looking to get. If the people you're trying to, to work with are not on social media, it kind of doesn't make sense for you to spend as much time on social media, but in reality, you are not just targeting the, the clients themselves. You are also targeting their family members, their friends, their relatives who might be aware of um, the their friend or family who is working on the business and they know that your friend or family is looking to create a website, they could probably pop up and say, hey, I, I saw this um, this person's Instagram, look at check out their work. So market yourself everywhere. You want to be available online because we are in the 20th century. Everyone is in a digital space now. You want to be available on social media. You want to be, you want to be on Google. You want to make sure that your SEO is top rank. So if they type in um, for example, I'm not sure like where you might be, but if I if they are living in um, Canada, for example, and they want to type in designer Canada, your name should be should be pretty high up. So focus on getting your SEO up there, and the platform that you want to focus again, social media, Google, because a lot of people actually look for for designers through Google as well. You also want to be on sites like Behance and Dribble. So if you're looking to work with agencies. Agencies are actually on Behance as well as Dribble, so you can create a profile, start to interact with these uh, companies that you really admire and you want to eventually work with. And if there are company, um, there are companies that you really want to work with, there there are not agencies. Start to interact with their social media. Um, get to know, like interact with them, so they their name starts popping up, and then they know they're like, oh, this this um John person always always comment on our 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 posts, like what does he do? And eventually, if you want to start a dialogue with them, because they recognize your name coming up, they understand that you're you're one of their, their valuable followers, they're going to be likely to want to get a conversation going with you. And I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure if I remember the, the, the next question. So what was the question again? So the question was, um, like I basically merged two questions, which was how to get the first client and how to market yourself. Right. Great, thank you. So again, I mentioned earlier, you can go through looking for charity work. You can also be reaching out to friends and family for, for work. So there is this sort of um, idea for whether or not you should be working for free. And I honestly believe that as you first start out, you cannot expect to be charging money for something that you don't have experience in. If you have experience, yes, please charge. But if you are totally new, 
you cannot expect to get paid for that. So keep that in mind. You can also look into becoming a design intern if you are looking to get the experience um, in order to get yourself to a, a, a part where you can get paid at. So in terms of finding clients, there are charities, you can go online, you can network with your local community, join the Chamber of Commerce, as I mentioned before, so you can get to know new businesses and just put yourself out there. I know as uh, creatives, we are mostly introverted. We do not like pushing ourselves out there, uh, putting ourselves out there or, and pushing ourselves to sell. But if you go in with the mindset of not trying to always sell, you're trying to go in because you want to connect with people. I feel like things will just kind of happen for there because you're not going in with high expectations of anything. You're going in and you're letting yourself go in, go with the flow. You're letting the, the conversation flow naturally. And even if things don't work out, it will work out at some point. I don't, I, I think you just have to be patient. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for answering that. Okay. Yeah, no problem. So do we have more slides next? Oh yeah, we actually have one more. Okay, so let's go ahead with that. Okay, sure. So when is a good... I have no at reason. least three months of savings set aside. And this this three months of savings should cover your day-to-day -day as well as running your business. So you cannot just have money in order to feed yourself, but if you're not able to pay for your subscriptions for your design programs or you're not able to pay for your website, then you cannot really have a business. So make sure that you also have work lined up as well, not just verbal agreements with your clients, but sign contracts and some form of deposit. The contract will kind of help you along the way, but deposits, people are people will not run away when they have like money put into you. So make sure that you have deposits um, paid out as well. And so if you are fresh out of school and you do not have a strong portfolio, no matter where in your journey you are, even if you're not just fresh out of school, I strongly recommend against jumping into freelance full-time. And so the reason why I say this is if you jump right into freelancing full-time, you're going to miss out on a lot of opportunities. So if you go into working for a company right when you're out of school, you actually get more experience working with teams. You get working with people who from different backgrounds, such as project managers, developers. These are all really important for you as you grow. And it also helps you to build up confidence. If you get into working with people, things start to happen naturally. So this is something that I, I remember uh, we just had the conversation about how to find your first client. But if you think about this, you go into your first company as a full-time employee. You're just talking to people. You're doing your job well. People really like you. When they think about wanting to start a side hustle or they know of a friend who's looking to get something designed or something developed, no matter what you do, they're going to think of you because you've been networking with them, letting them know that you're also open to freelance, even though you're working full time, this is going to open the doors of opportunity to you for freelancing. So when I first got into freelancing, I was doing this full time for two years. And then I began to hit a wall. There is this phrase in English that goes along the lines of, you don't know what you don't know. And I strongly believe in that. So you won't know what you don't know until you get to working with people in a company. Because working at a company as a new designer is great because you get to learn the right and wrong things of doing things. And it also allows you to improve yourself on someone else's dime and you're being paid for it. And you also get to work, um, sorry, you also get to go to conferences and workshops because good companies believe in investing in their talents. So you, if you're going to be looking for a full-time opportunity at any time, you want to make sure that the, the company you're applying to actually believe in that. They send their people to conferences and workshops. I had the great opportunity to to attend a lot of these and it helped me to open up the doors to networking with people and it was really really helpful for me and lastly the most important thing is you learn communication skills and i cannot stress this enough but it is really important for you to have good communication skill because no matter what you do day to day you're going to want to talk to people you're going to be communicating with clients if you are a great designer but you're you're terrible at communicating the client is probably not going to want to work with you so learning communication skill is really important no matter what role you're in and that's about it for for freelancing so and um, thank you again to everybody for sticking true till the end if you have any questions or if you want to learn more about becoming a kick-ass freelancer, please feel free to check me out on Instagram at Design Bites. So we can hop into Q&A right now if there are more questions. Yeah, so Helen, can we take two to three more questions if you have time? Because I know we are... Yep. We are okay, cool, awesome. So uh, one question that I would like to answer, which is asked by Anupam Gupta. And um, 
Ushan, uh, and they are basically asking about design contest on uh, how to win a design contest and uh, what if a client has given them five star rating and still you know they are they are not being chosen as a winner. So what we have seen on designer uh, Anupam, I'm not sure if you are uh, one of the designer with us, but um, you know if you follow the client uh, the the brief of the client very carefully if you understand the kind of brand you are designing for if you understand the values of those brands and if you understand the kind of design requirement that a client is giving i'm sure you would be very much close to winning what we have seen um, the mistake that designers are making on our platform is that while they are participating in the contest they are not following the brief as they should follow it because that's what basically the client is looking for right so if you are going to follow the brief very much carefully and if you are going to give them the work that they are looking for i'm sure you will be very much close to winning okay so that's that's the answer for anupam um, which was regarding um, the the client brief the for, regarding the contest helen i have for, uh, one to two more questions uh, for you and which yeah. is how can one establish trust and get work from overseas clients overseas clients you want trust and you want to get work from overseas clients honestly this is this is when you want to make sure that your online presence is really strong and not just having a website but like i mentioned earlier you want to be on linkedin so if you're not already on linkedin make sure you're on linkedin and you're connected to all your past clients and you're reaching out to your past clients so that they can give you recommendations on what it's like to work with you there is something about having that trust factor where a client of uh, potential clients can go to your profile they can see what your experience level is like they can see all the connections you have and they also see all the recommendations from the past people you've worked with so it, this is especially important when you want to work with international international clients because it's not like they can just call you up and then you guys meet for coffee or you can do virtual coffee but it's more so in the sense that they want to make sure that you're not going to scam them out of money so make sure that your portfolio is really um updated as well you have you have good portfolio pieces you, your website is up to date you have a linkedin um profile that's also up to date you have the location of where you're based you have recommendations from your client your previous clients and you also can put in logos of the previous um clients that you work with because this gives a little bit more of the trust factor just make sure that you ask for permission from your clients and you are not showing work that is under nda a lot of the work that we do is actually under nda so we cannot even talk about it but make sure that you cover your ass don't do anything that i wouldn't or anybody wouldn't so just make sure that you do things that the client is okay with so reach out and ask the client if they're okay to display if you're okay to display your work on on the website as well all right thanks for answering that as well yeah no problem uh, okay just well, one more question for you which is <laughs> what is the most important step for transitioning transitioning from freelancing to starting an agency what are the most important steps for it and what one should keep in mind if somebody wants to transition from freelancing to starting their own agency okay so this is a really good question because i went through the motion of this myself i think it really comes down to asking yourself why you're starting an agency do you believe that by starting an agency you're able to get more work or you're able to charge a higher premium price for the the work and you just want to make sure that you also have more than just yourself in the agency it, it's not really an agency if it's just you in your parents basement and there's nothing wrong with that by the way but you just want to make sure that you're able to offer something that you wouldn't be able to as a freelancer so connect with people that you want to start an agency with make sure that you work with them before this is really important because you can be talking to someone great but if you never and work with them before you're not going to be able to see how you guys gel together like if you guys do not vibe well together and work well together the agency is going to fall apart really really quickly so look up for look for people that you perhaps could start a side project um for fun and see how you guys work together make sure that you also build an extensive list of connections that you can reach out to when you get really busy because you're getting so much work from the clients that come through you want to make sure that you're not saying no to clients but you're also not trying to take everything upon yourself so connect with people that you can hire out you can outsource and they could, you could white label um the work for so that you're building your portfolio as an agency as well um yeah so you want to make sure that you also have savings because savings is really important so if you're starting an agency there are going to be a lot more that that you have to cover versus something like a solopreneur 
So you want to be investing in marketing yourself as well. And so make sure that you have the people that you're working with in um, on LinkedIn. So when you create a profile for yourself, your company profile, you also have these people. So it doesn't look like it's just you for the agency. And Amazing. yeah, I think that's it. Thanks for sharing uh, such uh, insights with us, Helen. And uh, I think that, uh, we have already passed 10 more minutes of our time. Yeah. So uh, I think that's all uh, that we had for today. Uh, just uh, would like to thank all of you guys who are still with us uh, live in the session and, uh, you know, have made uh, till the end. Uh, I'm sure, I, I hope it was um, insightful and helpful for you guys and uh, as i said previously as well that um if you have more suggestion to if you have suggestion to more topics that you would want to you know learn in the future uh let us know in the chat or you can also dm us on our instagram at designer dh uh for more questions that you would like to ask helen follow her on instagram and dm her and i hope uh, she would be able to uh, you know answer your questions there as well uh, because we are short of time and we won't be able to answer more questions now so um Thank you so much, guys, again for uh, joining us uh, in this session. And um, I hope it was helpful. Thank you so much, Helen, once again for being here, taking uh, out your time, and for this amazing, amazing session. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you again for having me, and thank you everyone for sticking through through this webinar. It's my first one, so it's really exciting. So if you have any questions, just like Rashmi mentioned, feel free to message me on Instagram and I'll try my best to get back to you with any any questions you may have. Thanks. Thank you so much, guys. Bye. See you in the next webinar, guys. Bye. Thanks. Bye.